Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, uh, Defend, Detect, Recover, Three Essential Steps to Protecting Data, brought to you by Insight and Rubrik. By way of introduction, uh, my name is Chris Capusta. I'm Senior Manager of Domain Architecture here at Insight. I'm joined today uh, from uh, Carl from Rubrik. Carl, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, Chris, uh, thanks for having me. I'm Carl Norwich. I work in the go-to-market here at Rubrik. I've been with the company since we had three customers, so about seven plus years ago, uh, I have the pleasure of uh, bringing new solutions in the, to the market uh, via Rubric, whether it be internal or uh, acquisition. Excellent, looking forward <laughs> to it. So just, just to kind of set the stage on some discussion points we're gonna go through today, um, significance of immutable data copies when we're talking backup and protection of data, you know, why understanding your data is crucial for recovery. And, and most importantly, something we're really going to touch on today, given some market trends and, and other uh, areas we'll, we'll talk about in a second here, how to protect your data from exfiltration, uh, the value of testing a recovery plan regularly, and how to quickly recover your data at scale. So as we, as we get started today, let's just kind of set the stage with a little bit of a state of the industry on, on ransomware and some of these security incidents today. I think as we all have seen from watching the news and, and other reports that ransomware events continue to increase in frequency. Uh, as, as long as there's money to be made, honestly, the bad actors are gonna be out there trying to infiltrate environments and 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 uh, hold that data hostage. And, and really what we're seeing is the bad actors are adjusting their methods as, as we all as an industry adjust our response. Uh, we saw very early on when these type of events were occurring, it was very much kind of a smash and encrypt type of event. They would break in as soon as they could. They would try and encrypt some, some systems or data, uh, and then they would demand a ransom to get them decrypted. And so we saw a lot of uh, the industry move towards focusing on recovery of data with these events. And we saw products like Rubrik come to market with immutability, um, with fast response times and restores at scale, uh, fast restore times, excuse me, and restore at scale. And it really changed the conversation of how we get these environments back as these encryption events occur. So we we saw the bad actors then move to kind of a sit and wait type of, uh, of scenario. So they would infiltrate an environment, but rather than encrypting uh, right away, they would look and find those, um, those, those uh, critical infrastructure that they could compromise. So things like the data protection environment, things like the storage environment and and so they would compromise those first uh try and inhibit the the ability to restore the data and then that uh, really you know tried to ensure that you would have to pay that ransom to get your data back but again as we're seeing these these systems like rubric that are i don't want to say immune but are, are better protected from these types of activities um, they had to really change the the way that they compromise this data and the way that they demand that ransom. So now they're starting to add data exfiltration to the mix. And, and one of the reports I saw recently, 30% of these encryption attack events are now including exfiltration. So you now they can encrypt the data, but now that we're getting more mature at recovering that data, they'll actually pull it out of your environment and hold it hostage and demand a ransom that way. And we're going to focus today a little bit on, actually quite a bit on how how Rubrik is, is, is adapting and meeting the response to that exfiltration and actually protecting the data even further. Uh, and as, as it says here, we have to adapt, adapt as the bad actors um, change their methodologies of what they're doing inside of our environments. So, you know, just to set the stage, prevention is still paramount. We still have to focus on keeping those bad actors out, but you know, with all of the different ways systems are compromised, with end users still being a target, with zero day flaws, with supply chains being uh, infiltrated in uh, the software we use inside of our environments, the, the, the methods and ways they're getting in just continually to increase. So we, we still have need to try to keep them out, but it's almost becoming a conversation of when we get infiltrated, not if we get infiltrated. So we still need that focus on recovery when those events occur, especially at scale. Um, it becomes a conversation of how do I restore entire environments? How do we restore operation across an entire business? No longer just files, folders, machines, anything like that. And so really, uh, alongside that, how do we address the data exfiltration problem? If the data is being stolen and held and held hostage, how do we work to prevent that from even occurring to make sure, again, we don't have to pay the ransom, our data is secure, and we have confidence that it's protected? So a lot of it is, you know, getting back to basics. Um, we we need to, you know, as I mentioned, backup is still important. We still need immutable copies of our backup data. Uh, the, those immutable copies cannot be changed, even if somebody happens to get into the system until those backups are expired. 
you know, uh, platforms like Rubrik were built with immutability in mind. Um, so we, we have that built into the system here. We still need multiple copies of our data in multiple locations. That, that three, two, one strategy that we've been following as an industry for decades is still important. And at least one of those copies should be air gapped. Uh, we, we've all heard the joke tape is dead, but in reality, we're seeing a resurgence from that perspective. Uh, because it's truly an air-gapped medium, but there's also vaults and cloud and object store and things we can put our data in that are secure uh, and, and off the network. Uh, and just a reminder, storage snapshots are not backups. They, you know, We need to work in conjunction with the storage environment. Snapshots are great for kind of immediate rollback or restore, but they can uh, be compromised. They are not a backup copy. They're not on a different medium. They don't follow a lot of that three, two, one process there. So we need to make sure we're backing up the data. And while backups are important, it's it's recovery that really matters there. So we need to test recovery at scale, again, more than just files and folders. And we need to do it at kind of random intervals. The, the old, we plan a BCDR test and we hope it all goes well, that's, that's not how things really occur during these cybersecurity events. So we need to regularly force teams to restore random environments back into production. The best way to test a restore is to rely on it. And if we can do that and, and show that it works outside of these incidents, uh, if one does occur, we'll be better prepared to respond and, and bring our environments back online. And then really, you know, the conversation focuses around all of this data. Our data is the most important thing and data classification is important. We have to know what type of data we have, where it resides. Is there regulations around it like GDPR and some and HIPAA and some of the other uh, regulatory uh, requirements that we have there? And, and this becomes more challenging because our data is everywhere. Uh, we're moving from those data centers to centers of data. So now we have we have copies at the edge. We have copies in the cloud providers. We have copies in SaaS providers. Uh, our data is everywhere. So we really need to understand where that data resides, how we protect it, how important it is to the business by classifying it, uh, and, and how we keep it from being uh, exfiltrated from the environment. You know, as the last point there, how do we protect that data from exfiltration? So I'm going to turn it over to Carl here. Carl's going to cover some of the uh, the features and functions that we want to go through today, uh, how we're how we're changing that conversation and how we're better protecting the data. So Carl, all, all yours. Yeah, appreciate it, Chris. So just a little bit of backdrop before we even get into this slide about Rubrik. I think this is important to what Chris was just discussing with everyone is that Rubrik was founded on the premise of a converged solution, much like Nutanix was to the VMware world, right? We took backup software, proxy, file system, conversion into one piece of software and made it scalable. And it was an operational E story that first brought Rubik to market when I joined uh, seven plus years ago now. Now, as cyber attacks became more relevant, there was a very good consequence of our design that I want to call out because I think it's important to think about, again, fundamentals like Chris was talking about. First of all, is because we're a closed loop system and we have an immutable file system or system of record, that put us in a very strong and powerful position to give you that ability to recover and to assure the availability of your data if it was under a destructive attack. And Rubrik's whole ecosystem for the past seven years or so has been, I'm going to assure your recovery, your ability to recover. I'm going to provide you tools to shrink the amount of time it takes you to recover and get your business back online as quickly as you can. The problem is, is that X, there's no undo or recovery from an exfiltration event. Once it's happened, it's happened. There's no way to undo it in the same way there's a way to recover from an encryption attack. And what, to Chris's point, what we're finding now is there's been a, pit, a fundamental pivot is that there's still dest destructive attackers certainly out there and you need to protect yourself against that. But now you need to start looking forward. Uh, how do I prevent exfiltration from happening in the first place? And Rubrik has taken that pivot with an acquisition of a company called Laminar in mid-August that we're excited to dis uh, talk about today. Uh, it's in the space, it's called DSPM, Data Security Posture Management. And the idea behind that is, let's understand where your critical data is is it in the correct security configuration? And let's give you very clear deterministic signals on where your business is most at risk, because at the end of the day, hackers aren't breaking in, they're logging in. And that's really what we're driving towards near from a problem statement, solution statement to provide to the marketplace, is that if we know that they're getting in, how do we prevent them from being able to access that important data, your crown jewels, and stop that exfiltration from happening in the first place? Because, you know, as you see here on the slide, 91% of uh, the, the initial cloud intrusion vectors were user driven, meaning users are making decisions. I know that's a mind blower for everybody. Users are making dumb decisions and putting your business at risk. So how do we thwart that or how do we prevent that? And that's really the context of our discussion today. Uh, Chris, would you mind moving on to the next slide, please? 
So what are the four principles behind this that are being driven with DSPM and this acquisition of Laminar by Rubric? Is first of all, we want to eliminate unnecessary data. I've talked to a lot of security practitioners. I'm going to call myself out. I'm a storage guy at heart. I grew up as a storage guy. If you look at my LinkedIn, I'm a storage guy. I'm working really hard to be a good security guy. But to do that, I've talked to a lot of security folks. And the thing that I found really quickly was one of the biggest places your business is at risk is the data you don't even know about. The unmanaged backups, the snapshots, the dumps, all these different things that get scattered because cloud is great because I can have just-in-time consumption of resource. It sucks for security because your users can have just, just-in-time access to resources, right? So first and foremost, we want to eliminate unnecessary data in your environment so that we can A, drive down cost, which is very important because it is a metered service in the cloud, but secondarily drive down risk by getting rid of that, that sensitive data that's been not being looked at or managed. Secondly, we want to limit access. Do the users have access to the right data at the right time? And how can we get ourselves in a position to cut off access to assets that users shouldn't have access to? Third is how do we ensure the best security configurations are in place on your data resources? I think this is really important because this is not just configuration, it's contextualization as we'll talk about here. The fact that you see a security configuration on a data resource doesn't tell you anything necessarily because you may have whitelisted that. You may have done that intentionally. It might be a dev operation. It might be developers and lowering friction to open up, turning off encryption or masking, these different things. You may have done it purposefully, but what do you do if one of those knuckleheads puts a bunch of customer data into that data resource? Now your position or your opinion on that configuration has changed. And that's what we want to drive towards here. It's not just about the configuration, yeah, configuration is about understanding the type of data that's in the data asset plus the configuration, which paints a much more thorough picture. And then lastly, of course, this is not a one-time fix. We need to monitor this as it happens and make sure that you're always in the best possible position to prevent an exfiltration from happening in the first place. Chris, any thoughts on that? No, I I, I think this, you know, it, there's always the day zero problem and then the day 90 problem. We, we set everything up pristine day zero. Everything has the best possible security policies. And then, you know, as 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 users access systems, as requirements change, we often drift from those. So, you know, not only fixing the problem up front, but continuing to monitor and make sure we stay within those policies and, and monitor the activity going forward. Uh, absolutely love it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, no, it's 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 it, again, users are going to do users things, right? <laughs> uh, no, with no doubt. Uh, would you mind going to the next slide? So, how are we going to address this, right? So, why did we make this acquisition? Why is Rubric going right a boom? Everything I, I say right a boom, meaning you have an encryption event. Everything in our history has been left a boom. How do we get you back online faster, effectively, without reinfection? That's our mantra, right? Now, this movement for us as a company is us trying to again, to Chris's point adapt to the ecosystem and the things that are going out in the world amongst uh, going on in the world. How do we get right a boom? How do we stop it from happening in the first place? So first thing is, if you wouldn't mind clicking your Chris, is uh, asset discovery. I um, Before we'd even acquired Laminar, I was fortunate to go golfing with a CISO buddy of mine named Pete in Austin, uh, covered in tattoos. Who would have thought he's an executive? That's Austin. Keep Austin weird, guys. <laughs> but the reason that I bring that up is that what he had mentioned to me was, and it stuck with me, is if I don't know about it, I can't secure it. So the first fundamental foundation here is, is that we do autonomous asset discovery with this solution, meaning the moment you deploy it, we do a full and complete inventory of every data resource you have running within your cloud, and we do it continuously. So as a workload comes online, we discover it. That's very important because think about it, if you don't know about it, you can't protect it, you can't enforce it, right? So that's fundamental table stakes. Uh, next click, please, Chris. The next is the classification part. So what we do is we do automatic onboarding. As soon as we see those workloads, we're gonna run analyzers against those workloads. Now varying support, but we support GCP, AWS, Azure, M365, Google Workspace, and Snowflake, just to get us started here. And the reason that's important is once we've uh, gotten a total uh, uh, asset list for you, we're gonna automatically go out and classify that data. Now you might be thinking like, why are those horizontal at the bottom? A lot of providers are saying, this is what it is. We don't look at it as a use case. That's what are you going to do with data classification? Oh, more noise, more, more tools to tell me why I suck at my job. Great, thanks so much. That's not what this is driving here. Exactly, Chris, thank you so much. How do you take these foundations and drive towards a use case? So what does this provide us? What can we bubble up to you? First of all, we with data access policy, we can tell you who has access to what, or data access governance. Secondly, who's accessing what? That's very important as well. In near real time, we're able to watch activity logs keep a history on users accessing sensitive data 
and see if something out of the norm is happening so that you can be alerted if an exfiltration attack is underway. And that third one, I think, is the most important. You can almost argue should be the first bubble there is your data security posture. Is my sensitive data in a position where it can't be stolen? That's what posture is. I hate all these acronyms that we as an industry do is DSPM this and CSPM that and CNAP and I can keep going on. But at the end of the day, what does this tool do? It tells me what I have in the cloud. It tells me what's in the cloud that is running and it tells me what is the posture. Is it in the best possible position to be protected from one of these exfiltration attacks before it happens? Because as I mentioned at the onset, you can't. Uh, there's no undo button for an exfiltration event. You have to stop it before it happens in the first place. And one last click there, Chris, is that we're going to do this continuously. This is not a one-time thing or one-time job. It's a fully hands-off managed solution that's going to be constantly and perpetually assessing your inventory, your classification, contextualizing, and telling you the posture of your data. Any thoughts there, Chris, before we move on? No, I, I completely agree with what you said there. And I, you know, we 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 help a lot of clients do these events. We help a lot of clients try and avoid these events and and firm up their security posture. And and the the first conversation we have is, do you know where your data is? And and most answer yes. And then we do these type, we put these types of solutions in, and it's it's always a surprise. Well, I didn't know this was there. I didn't know that was stored <laughs> there. You know, so it's it's almost um, finding those skeletons in the closet, if you will, and and being able to, especially with cloud and shadow IT and the things that just go on that it's not malicious, but it's just outside corporate standards and it's it's done with the best intentions. But the the ability to store data anywhere, access data anywhere, and and unfortunately have data leak anywhere becomes a real problem. So, you know, just having that visibility across the board is is instrumental in in preparing and preventing these types of attacks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I I I, I would I'm going to say this in the polite professional way, but you'd be you you would be amazed at the bleep that we find when we do POCs. <laughs> uh, it's a technical. It's an industry term. It's technical. It's fine. No, I th I think most tech guys actually say it more verbosely. But hey, right. uh, but either way, I mean, it's it, it, again, you can only know so much. And when users are empowered to dump backups, to spin off copies, to do all, this, it, it makes sense. Like, at least in a data center, you're constrained by hardware. In right. the cloud, you're only constrained by your ability to burn down your Mac. I mean, if we're being honest. So that's what we're driving towards fundamentally. That's what the solution is. Let's stop it before it happens and give you very clear deterministic signals of where you need to prioritize your time. So if you want to go back to the next slide, uh, Chris, is it, let's talk a little bit about the intentional design principles. So why are we different? There's companies out there that have been doing classification on-prem. I won't name any out of respect, of course, and they've done great. Some are publicly traded, nothing but respect in the uh, most respect in the world. But why is this different? Because it's a cloud forward design meant for the cloud. And there's some tenants here that I want to call out that were intention, intentional design principles behind the product to make you have, have give you peace of mind while the solution is running. So the first one is, is we don't you don't have to pay us to exfiltrate your data. I know that's mind blowing, but everything that we do is in place within your cloud environment. So we're not moving your data or egressing the data out of your control. You're never, ever, ever losing custody of your data with Rubik Lamb and our solution. First and foremost, so you're never losing custody. You don't have to worry about DPAs with us and us moving data out of the environment. So that's number one. Number two is agentless. Everything's driven by Lambdas and Azure serverless functions, for an example. So that means that you don't have to deal with agents. You don't have to deal with connectors. You don't have to deal with onboarding. Because remember, we're autonomously doing the asset discovery for you. And we're automatically classifying. So that's really important, is that you don't have to worry about adding a connector. Because why does that matter? I know Chris knows. Let's think about it. If I have to install an agent, that means I have to know about it. And if I don't know about it, I can't classify it. You're in this death loop, right, Chris? Exactly. So that's why that's so important. You may be like, ah, all my products can do an inventory. But can they? You have, If you have to know about it, you can't know that you're 100% secure. And that's why I think that's so important. Uh, number three is it's fully autonomous. We're not going to ask for the keys to your kingdom. We're a read-only function in, uh, in nature. Um, and we've got some great uh, security mechanisms from a design perspective to protect your data while we're deployed, but fully autonomous in nature, as I mentioned, no agents, no connectors. Uh, plug and play, once you deploy us, deployment happens via Terraform to cloud formation is extremely quick. As you can imagine, uh, your time to value is 15 minutes, 30 minutes, something like that. You'll start, we'll start populating our GUI. And then lastly, most importantly, is that it's asynchronous in nature, so you don't have to worry about us negatively impacting production. Um, and I think that's really important when you deploy a tool like this because there is a history here, if we're being honest. If you let some of these classification tools rip in production, there's a, a whole bunch of tickets getting opened up. And that's peace of mind you don't need to worry about with us is that there will be zero impact to production. 
Awesome. Well, let me keep going, going, Chris. Um, So how does it work? So it's a quick uh, design principle real quickly here, but I want to call this out because I think it's really important is that I mentioned that you never lose custody of your data and we don't ask for elevated credentials. So you're immediately thinking like, what? How is that possible? So we did some things very purposefully from a design perspective to protect your data and give you the functionality. So when you deploy us, we're going to deploy into your cloud environment what we call an outpost. Think of it as a coordinator. It's going to manage all the serverless functions that are taking place. But as you can see in this graph here, it's gapped. So that outpost has no direct access to your your production data. What it's going to do is coordinate spinning up Lambdas and Azure serverless functions that do work with your production data to do that classification and produce metadata. Only that metadata is being shipped out to the outpost, which is then sent out to our platform for the purposes of presentation and monitoring. You're never ever losing custody of your data. And even if somebody were to hack our outpost, again, that outpost does not have direct rights to your production data. So we're effectively creating gaps here. So that even if our account's compromised, you're still, you still have peace of mind. And because it's only metadata and it's anonymized in nature, if there's somebody to compromise anything else, you have peace of mind. And that's why not losing custody or your data is, is a very important part. But secondarily, is not giving a service account keys to the kingdom because what if that service account gets hit? And that's how we ensure the secure nature of our product as it's uh, deployed. Yeah, I, I think that's an important part to talk about there. Not only the service account, the lack of service account, I'll say, and and you know, which basically eliminates another path for a, an infiltrator to take. But it, it's not another copy of the data moving somewhere. We we talked earlier about how our data is spread all over the world as it is already. The last thing we need is another copy out there that that's susceptible to attack or or exfiltration or whatever. So. You know, doing all of this without moving the data from its original location is is a huge advantage. One hundred percent. And and again, the, the guys who put it together, Israeli based company, very security minded as you can imagine. Um, and that's part of what they designed here, which I think is great. So I, I think uh, Chris, we've done a lot of talk, and I think it's time to do some showing, don't you think? Yes. I was gonna say slides are great, but but demos are better. So I'm gonna I'll, I'll stop sharing here and turn it over to you. Love it. All right. Let's let's see the toy in action here. Stand by real quickly here. All right, Chris, you can see uh, the screen. Yes. All right, fantastic. All right, so I've already authenticated into our uh, demo environment. This is uh, the rubric lamb in our platform. So if you chose to do a POC or move forward the solution, this is what you would see. So high level here on the dashboard is across the top. You can see macro everything that we're looking at here. The number of assets, uh, things that are at risk, our total data volume, active violations, and then sensitive data records. Now this is. Nice to know, I suppose, because you want to know all of these things. But like, I want to focus in over here. I mentioned earlier that classification by itself is noise. It's not signal, right? And this right here is a great example. And even in our demo environment, we have 44 million sensitive data records that I found. Now, if you use a classification tool, this in and of itself is not particularly useful. I mean, what do you do with that? You probably just like, well, OK, yay. Right. And I talked to you, I, I mentioned the idea of signal to noise ratio and trying to provide very clear signals. So what I want to do here is everyone, this is all self-describing. Everyone can read this, but I want to go into a workflow real quickly with this short time that we have together and show you how the, how powerful this tool is. So I want to draw your focus here to this top assets at risk. This is a great example of how we take a lot of noise and turn it into clear signals. So you can see here, these are my top assets at risk. And you can see they're marked with critical, and these are varying from S3 buckets to Snowflake instances and so on. Uh, and let's go ahead and go to the very top asset that's at risk is Acme demo web dev. So if I select this, this brings me into my asset inventory and I get into the Explorer now. So across the, in the top board here, you can see what, what it is, where it is, how big it is, who owns it, which is important here in a moment, creation date and otherwise, right? But below on this risk assessment, this is where I want to draw your attention. As you can see, there's two different scores here that we're, we're using. We have a risk score and we have a sensitivity score. And this is how we're taking all the information that we're gathering and giving you a clear signal by juxtaposing the two together. So from a risk score perspective, you can see here what we're doing is looking at the configuration of the data asset itself. And you can see here, here are the violations. First of all, is publicly accessible as access permissions that aren't correct. And if you want to get something a little more specific, you can see down here under the security analysis at the bottom, this is what it's flagging. Your logging is disabled, it's unencrypted, and it's publicly exposed. Well, again, that by itself doesn't necessarily tell you anything because maybe you did that on purpose. Maybe this is for web caching. I mean, insert here use case, but this by itself isn't a problem necessarily, right? 
Now on the right hand, you see a sensitivity score, which is restricted, and that's being driven by the data classification portion of the windows here. And you see below that we're finding everything from personal data to financial and business proprietary information here. Now, again, if this were by itself, this isn't necessarily telling you anything. It's just telling you there's sensitive data there, right? But what happens when I combine the two? I have the makings of a really bad day happening here because now I know I have an insecure data, data resource with sensitive data containing it. And that's what I want to call out again about that clear signal. You have to know what you need to action against and how to prioritize your day. Because if you try to fix everything in the world, you'll never get your job done. And the, us combining these two points of view into a score and into a flare, if you will, or signal, is what differentiates us and why it's so powerful at preventing exfiltration. Now, for anybody who's security minded sitting here watching this, they're like, yeah, great, but I don't fix it. I have to go over to the application owner and they need to fix it. So nobody wants to be wrong. Nobody wants to eat crow. So you're going to want to go through a phase of verifying what I'm showing you here to make sure it's not uh, not a false positive or, or the alike. So what does that workflow look like? So if I want to go investigate this, because this is clearly a problem, but I want to make sure, is let's say that I found this, this credit card numbers. I want to vet that a bit more. All I do is I go over here and I select the credit card icon over here. And what I've done now is I've moved into the data explorer part of the asset. And it's filtered down to the two areas where in, in the S3 tree where it's found those credit card numbers. So you can see here under clients, I can see here that there's a Q3 data, sales data.csv. Well, kind of see how there could be a credit card number in there potentially. And then under the temp, you can see there's a backup.sql. That makes a lot of sense too, because I could totally see a DBA taking a backup, dumping it into an S3 bucket he happened to find because he needed a backup of his data. Never happened, right? Never. <laughs> so again, we can go over here and validate that this backup, for an example, which is structured in nature, mind you, because it is a backup dump of a uh, .sql. I can see, again, there's those credit card numbers. But again, I want to verify this. So what I can do now is I can select this file. And I get a whole bunch of good information here so that I can start validating. First of all, I think it's important is because we look at the metadata, we can actually see what database this backup originated from, which I think is extremely important here because if this is in fact true, you're gonna wanna go have a conversation with whoever owns this. Again, additionally, we look at who the owner is, which you see here as well, and you can see the type. Going below, we can talk about the access and some of the violations such as it's publicly exposed and not encrypted. And then the data types down below. But again, you're not sure. What if this tool is wrong? You don't want to be that guy or gal being wrong when you're yelling at somebody, right? So let's go validate further into this metadata tab. And if I crack this guy open here, I can see here under customer data, there's my credit card numbers inside the tables. Because we not only do we unstructured data, we do structured data. So even though this is a backup, we know what it's a backup of. And because we do structured data, we can actually go in and crack open the file and scan it and categorize it. Otherwise, you would have never known about this, right? So what I want to do now is I'll go down to the credit card and I'm going to go to sample data. When I select this function, what we're doing is we're launching a Lambda within your cloud environment and it's going and in, in improving it to you, essentially. It's producing this data and it's exposing it to me through this authenticated browser session. So once again, the data is never leaving your custody whatsoever. This browser session is communicating directly with your cloud environment. And this is how you're able to go in and validate, yep, that's a credit card number. And I, I don't know, this is the ticket. This is probably more like a phone call on a five, five alarm fire. <laughs> what, <laughs> what's above P1? Cause that's what that is. <laughs> exactly, right? So so when we, we validated it and everyone's comfortable with it, what you would do next is we don't wanna be on an island. We understand that SOCs have lots of, lots of sophisticated software and ecosystems, right? So we wanna plug into that. So what I can do now is go to the, the violation and we integrate with Jira, ServiceNow, and Salesforce. And we can go in and create a ticket, get it into that project management pipeline for remediation. But again, in this example, probably a phone call, maybe both. Um, and we can get this in the pipeline. You see in this example, we've actually already created a ticket, which is represented here. So that's just a quick run through of how you can leverage this tool to get yourself in a proactive preventative stance from exfiltration attacks. So. Uh, one last thing I'll hit on here, and then Chris and I can probably wrap this thing up, but I, what are we looking for? So the product comes out of the box with 38 can policies, and they go into four macro uh, uh, categories of overexposed data, unprotected data, misplaced data, which is very GDPR or California-centric, for an example, 
and then redundant data. And the reason I went to this pane, and just so you know, you can create as many custom policies as you would like if you're looking for proprietary information, genomics, whatever that may be. But I wanted to go here just to call out this redundant data because I mentioned a best practice at the onset was get rid of redundant or unused data, right? So this tool is actively out of the box going and looking for sensitive abandoned assets, unmanaged backups, backups that are sitting there where their origin or their parent has been deleted, self-hosted database and otherwise. So this is powerful again for two points. One, I think we can all agree that the data that's most at risk is the one that the data that nobody's paying attention to. This is going to help you identify that extremely quickly. And this is a cost savings move because if we're able to go and identify all the redundant uh, data that's sitting out there that's not being leveraged, you're being metered against that. Let's draw, let's delete that, let's get that offline, and let's start saving you some money. So this is just to tie up the loop on the very first bullet point I brought up on what are the best practices here. This solution does this right out of the box and can be self-funding, in fact, it, it, depending on how the tidy your environment is in the cloud. So Chris, with that, I'm gonna hand it back to you, sir. Um, stand by and stop sharing. And um, I think we're at the point of wrapping up. We are. <clears throat> so just a, just a quick recap on some of the things we talked about today. And 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 Carl, I, I will say it's, you know, Rubrics always done a great job of, of managing the data once it hits its platform. But I really think this Laminar uh, acquisition, you know, as you mentioned, kind of moving the, the focus and extending out into the environment. So being proactive before it even hits the platform. So, you know, just extending that security posture and policy obviously uh, gives us better insight into the data and helps us secure it and, and deal with these new threats that we have to deal with like exfiltration. But just to kind of recap here. So, you know, as we said earlier on, backups are important, but you know, it's really restores and recovery that uh, that kind of guarantee if we all have a job tomorrow. So recovery is what matters. And, and you know, we beat this drum quite a bit as we talk to clients, uh, have a plan and practice the plan. If the first time you're executing a recovery plan is during an event, it, it's too late. And and having been a part of a few of these myself, I can I can attest to the the chaos and the uncertainty and and that goes on during these things so you know have a plan execute the plan practice the plan regularly do it uh, do it unplanned i think is the best way to do it introduce a little bit of that chaos as you're practicing it to to ensure that when you do execute it you're you're aware of where you know what do we need to change what do we need to revise how do we iterate that as we move forward Mutability is still important. Uh, we need a copy of that data, preferably close to our production environment. So we, we have this uh, the quicker restore times, but we need a copy that's immutable. It's stored on a on a file system, on a media that can't be altered. It can't be uh, can't be um, accessed and, and deleted before its expiration date. And those three, two, one backups still apply. We need three different copies on two different mediums. One of them should be offsite and air gapped. And really, you know, as we talked about today, we really need to understand the data. It's great that just we're just out there backing everything up, but we just really need to understand what's in our environment. And, and to Carl's point early on, we need to understand what we don't know about in the environment. It's it's great to to understand kind of our tier one, our our production data, maybe our sensitive data, but there's a lot lurking out there that organizations are not aware of. And we need a way to be able to classify and understand that. And and to Carl's point. We need to understand that dark and dormant data. What do we do with it? You know, the the backup of a database somebody restored and forgot about, or the, you know, the application someone spun up in a cloud provider and left there and forgot about, and it's unsecured. You know, what do we not know about? What's not frequently accessed, and how do we address that? Either we secure it, we delete it, we remove it. You know, whatever the case may be. Just um, you know, outside of the cost saving um, features that Carl brought up, it's it's also just that better security posture that it brings from us and and allows us to really protect the data from exfiltration. And and as we've, you know, along with that restore message earlier on, recovery at scale matters. Um, Rubric as a platform was built for fast restores. Uh, we need to be able to recover entire events. Uh, I'm sorry, entire. Uh, um, we need to restore entire. Um, areas of the company, so to speak, sorry, uh, as when these events occur. So, you know, ransomware events are entire company events. It's it's not something that just if, if impacts or affects part of a company. It's a kind of an all hands on deck type of situation. Uh, we need to really understand the business tolerance for downtime. And that really becomes our metric for what our restore at scale capabilities need to be. We we need to meet match the needs of the business to make sure we can continue to function. And uh, again, I know I said we beat it quite a bit, but I'm going to beat it one more time. We need to test recovery. 
Um, we can't be the first time during a, a security event. And, and I should probably put one more in there, you know, given some of the topics we talked about today, but we need to understand the data. Data is, is the livelihood, the, the lifeblood of the organization, uh, the better insights, the better protection we have around it. As we mentioned, bad actors are now trying to steal it and use it as, as hold it hostage and use it for ransom. Anything we can do to just better understand what we have, uh, where it is and how we protect it uh, uh, prevents those events from occurring and, and helps us recover quicker. So um, that's what we have today. Carl, any any closing thoughts as we kind of wrap today? Uh, no, I appreciate uh, the partnership with Insight over the years. Uh, you guys have been with us since the beginning and uh, it's a real pleasure to see uh, see us work together to solve problems for our clients. And I totally, just like going to the gym, test your recovery. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Early and often, that's what, that's what we like to say. But well, with that, we'll we'll wrap it up for today. Again, we'd like to thank everyone for your time and thank you for joining. Uh, if you do have any questions or would like some additional information, please visit our website at solutions.insight.com. Again, thank you very much and have a great day. Bye, everybody.